said God cannot lie He promised to save His people He never changed His mind Today He still calls them my people My people, my people Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Hallelujah. So on behalf of myself, Alice, and Mark, I want to welcome you in the wonderful, the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue on in our study of the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. Yes. Looking to find the things that are pleasing to God and the things that are displeasing to God. Because after all, that should be our goal, is to be pleasing to God. Amen. Okay, we, uh, we're in the letter, the sixth of the seven letters, the letter to the church at Philadelphia. And I believe this is our third week in that. This is our 23rd week in the study. Hmm. But before we start, I'm going to ask Brother Mark to ask God's blessing upon our time together. Oh Lord, we thank you for being within our midst. And we just pray that you give us your wisdom and understanding. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. All right, so we had left off last in our last session last week. In, uh, let's see, the 10th verse of uh, Revelation chapter 3, Revelation 3.10. <clears throat> and we were about halfway through that verse. So I'm, I'm going to start by reading the entire verse. And then we'll pick it up where we left off. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Okay, we were talking about uh, keeping us from the hour of testing in that last session. So we're going to start now talking about that hour which is about to come upon the whole world. We're not talking about, uh, we're talking about pretty significant times. Yes. There have been trials and tribulations Ever since, years, right? Forever. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's uh, 3,000 years ago that David wrote many of the afflictions of the righteous. It, it, that's nothing new. What is new is the scope of what's going to happen. Right. So I said, we, I think I ended last week talking about, you know, there have been world wars. But the simple fact of the matter is there's been no war that engrossed the entire world. That's right. With one possible exception. Okay. Cain and Abel. Ah, right. <laughs> Yeah, that was I mean, that, 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 got every, that got every young man in the world involved. Okay. Um, but what's coming is no light matter, right? When the Apostle Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he warned of the perilous times that would come in these last days. And the Greek word that's translated perilous there in 2 Timothy 3, is used only one other place in scriptures, and that's in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, I'll, I'll read that to you. Matthew eight twenty-eight. When he, Jesus, came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. Well, the word that's translated perilous in 2 Timothy that's the word that's translated there in Matthew as extremely violent. Extremely violent. What he's talking about is demonic rage. It's a time that's coming of demonic rage. These were men filled with demons who were so violent that people could not even travel on that way without their lives being in danger. Where, where was that? That was in Judea? And, Across the Sea of Galilee. The Galilee. Okay, but that was controlled by Rome. Okay. You know, it was Rome's job to keep order. Wow. Well, supposedly. Well, it was. I don't understand why the Romans didn't send out guards or something to straighten that matter out. Just well, wipe them out. You don't understand. Just okay. that. We will have history classes later <laughs> to examine how well governments fulfill their God-given ministry of protecting us from evil yes. doers. I think the Romans were a lot better at doing that job than the governments now. Well, that may be the case, but 
you'll find that governments tend to be do things that Benefit have them. self interest. Mm -hmm. So if it was only in this spot where you know the people that were traveling that way and it wasn't affecting the commerce of the Roman Empire, it might not have been a high priority for them. Okay. Okay. Uh, and remember, God is in control, so he knew all this was going to take place so that he would have this testimony. I, listen, I've, I've traveled a lot of the world, and I, you know, I've seen <laughs> places. I have yet to have been to a place where I honestly believe that I have seen governmental agencies truly fulfill the ministry that God has given them. Mm -hmm. They've been given the sword, it says in the Word, you know, to protect us from evildoers. They're supposed to be responsible for, for you know, uh, enforcing that just conduct. Mm -hmm. They don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They never have. I mean, here in America, we have a fairly high crime rate. And the fact of the matter is, in America, we have the highest percentage of population in prisons of any nation on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. We still got that high crime rate. Yes. Um, okay, I don't want to get too sidetracked on that. So it's, it's involved in perilous times. Mm -hmm. But it gets worse. Yes. I say, you know, all of the things that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, you know, there's going to be famines, there's going to be, in the last days, there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be famines, there's going to be wars, there's going to be rumors. Well, there's always been those things. Right. So it has to be a matter of degree. Right. And it, speaking of degree, in Matthew 24, right, when Jesus was asked by his disciples what the signs of his coming, those last days, would be, he said that because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Matthew 24, 12. So there's an increase in all of this. And the Gospel of Luke records that Jesus had said that men's hearts would mm -hmm. fail them because of fear for the things coming on the earth. Now, we, who are the redeemed of the Lord, are not most men. He said most men's love will grow cold. We're not most men. No. Right? We're supposed to be different. Faith is supposed to be our portion, not fear. Okay? So bearing in mind that he had just said that he would keep us from the hour of testing, we got to focus on the words starting in Psalm 107. Mm -hmm. Okay? That was the verse that we finished up with last week, right? Think about this. Because what it says in Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2, is this. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. So rather than, you know, crying out in fear, we're supposed to be rejoicing. We're supposed to be giving thanks. We're supposed to be proclaiming him. We're supposed to be going around saying, we are the redeemed of the Lord. And we shall say so. And we shall say so. You see, we can give thanks. We can count it all joy, like James said. We can exult in our tribulations, like, like Paul said in Romans 5. Like Peter and the other apostles, we can rejoice when we are considered worthy to suffer shame for his name's sake, just like they did. All of that comes from believing the words. How did this whole letter to Philadelphia start? Believing the words of he who is holy, who is true. The one who said to all of us who are the redeemed, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, he said. John 14, 1. And then he goes on in that chapter to say, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Not, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. John 14, 27. So if you believe Jesus... No, did he not say, be anxious for nothing? So as we face the perilous last days, what should your attitude be? Your attitude is supposed to be the same all the time, an attitude of thanksgiving. I mean, how, what you were saying, that the perilous times, what, what is so different about it is that, the, that it means demonic rage. It is going to be a time. It's going to be a time that we've never really experienced. I, I'm, I'm saying it's going to be a time of demonic rage, but I think we are seeing in parts of the world today that it is a demonic rage. Right that is spreading. Yes. And it will spread to every corner of the globe. That's the difference between what's happened in the past and what will happen in these final days. Right. There will be no land exempt. Right. Switzerland will not be able to sit there and say we're neutral. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Spain will be neutral. No place will be neutral. Because it's, the battle is not against other countries. The battle is against the Lord. Okay. It, it's interesting where it says that I will keep you from the hour of testing. It says it in in, in the letter to this church and not the church of Laodicea. That, that, that means the church of Laodicea is very, very short. The time for that church is very, very short. Well, Find we'll talk about that when we get, when we get to the church of Laodicea. <laughs> Uh, did I read this? These things I have spoken to you, Jesus said, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. So this is, we talked about this extensively in our last session. If you missed that, go back. It's still up on Bible Talk, and it will be this entire series. But it's a matter of, you know, whether we're going to be delivered from it or through it. The point is... We will be delivered. We'll be delivered. Regardless of how he chooses to do it, we will be delivered. And that's the assurance that we have, right? And that's why you can be anxious for nothing. Amen. <clears throat> now the purpose of this, it says here in this verse, is to test those who dwell on the earth. Okay. This demonic rage that's coming is going to test those who dwell on earth. Whew. Thank God I don't dwell on earth. <laughs> you believe it? Just passing through. Our citizenship is in heaven. Aha, Philippians 3.20. That's a good verse. You see, I don't dwell on the earth. Like the other saints that Peter wrote to long ago in his first letter, right? Who only reside as aliens sojourners, just passing through. That's, right. That's what we're supposed to be. God instructed his people when he took them out into the wilderness on the way to the promised land. He said, you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down to Egypt and sojourned there. Deuteronomy 26, 5. We're supposed to be these aliens, these sojourners, right. not dwelling in the land. See, the word is in the Greek here, and this is why words are so important. And one of the things that so it troubles me about so many of the translations that are out there today, if indeed they're even qualify as translations. Because when they start to change what God said to make it easier to understand, or whatever their justification is, the simple fact is God says every word is purposed every word. Because all scripture, every word that he has spoken is God-breathed and profitable. The word that's used in this verse to dwell literally means, it's a Greek word that means to house permanently. To settle down in the dwelling. To dwell fixed, fixedly in a place. Whereas the word that Peter used, to reside, that's a different thing. It means to sojourn in a strange place. An alien, sojourner. The word is thus used metaphorically of those to whom heaven is their own country and who are sojourners on earth. Okay. There's two different words yes. and there's two purposes. We don't dwell here. We're not fixed here on earth. Just reside. We just ride, reside. You know, I... I the three of us, I think we have been extremely blessed, and some of you may be able to relate to this. <clears throat> we've spent so many much time in foreign countries. I mean, we've lived in foreign countries. We lived together in Belize, Central America. Mm -hmm. Well, when we were there, we had to be submissive to governing authorities. Yes. We had to obey the speed limits and do all of those things. But we didn't have the rights of citizens of that country because we weren't. Mm -hmm. We were aliens, yes. right? Legal aliens, by the way. Yes. <laughs> but we were aliens, so we couldn't vote. We, there were things we couldn't do because we were not a part of that society. Mm -hmm. We lived there. We didn't dwell there permanently. We didn't dwell there anymore. But we, we resided as aliens and sojourners. This is a difference. It's really, really important. And you need to get this. And I'm going to say, quite frankly, that my, my, what I see is that the church doesn't get that. We're not to be part of this world. We're not to be friends with this world. If you make yourself a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Well, if they did get it, they wouldn't be going on about dominion theology. Well, the, the fact is, we are ambassadors. Ambassadors don't live in the country they serve. They're foreigners here. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, I don't want to get... I, I, I'm going to stay on, stay on track. Stay on track. <laughs> so, if the church doesn't get that, how about this verse from, from 1 Peter chapter 2? Mm -hmm. 
Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, lust which war against us all. He's always addressing them as sojourners and pilgrims. You're not part of this. You don't dwell in the land. You're passing through. I'm a poor wayfaring stranger. Hallelujah. So we can sing as a church. We can sing those old hymns. I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. But in reality, we often seem far more focused on our homes here on earth, in Egypt and the wilderness, rather than the destination. You know, I know I've shared this before, but a number of years back, uh, we had been in England, Alice and I had been in England for a while, and I was finishing up our tour, I don't know how long we've been there, a month, a couple of months, and I was preaching in a church in London. And we were flying out of Heathrow back to the U.S. the following day. And after the, after the services, somebody came up to me and said, I understand you're going home tomorrow. And I said, only if the plane crashes. And that's the truth. That, that is the truth. Now, that, that may, you know, it kind of takes people back when you say things like that. But it's the truth. It makes it them is. think. Well, I hope it, I, hope, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't say these things to be argumentative or anything. I mean, as a matter of fact, I didn't for, even think about that. For a shock reason. I don't say it for shock. It just no, popped out. No, no. Because that's, I hope, the attitude that I have developed is this is this is not my home. This is my tent. Yeah. You know, for, for the past few years, Alice and I have been living out of a suitcase mm -hmm. with no place to, to call our own other than a post office box. And that was definitely too small for us to fit in. And now we're back, and we've just just now gotten a place. But our purpose here is to fulfill that part of the ministry that God is calling me to, is to finish up some of the books that I've been writing. So I'm taking a, a little break from all that travel. I don't know how long. I don't know what God has planned. <clears throat> so we're here in our, our new digs, our new apartment. Still not. I don't dwell here. <laughs> this is a... This temporary. is temporary. Everything, you want to know something? There's nothing on this earth that you're looking at that's not temporary. That's right. Okay. All of this is to say that the redeemed are not the ones being tested and tried here. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. not, not the ones, we're not being tested and tried here on earth any more than Stephen was when he was stoned to death. That's right. Was he, was he tested? Was he tried? I mean, you can, you can say what you want, but listen to what the Word of God says. Stephen, now, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Acts 7, 55 and 56. See, so it all depends on how you see things. When a person is tested, it is to refine them. Well, this, this, yes, it's to increase their faith. Well, not necessarily to increase. I mean, because... If, okay, they could go either yeah, way. No, no, they could because walk if, away, too. If, these people, if people who have no faith are being tested. Okay? I, where Mark is going with this, and that's one of the reasons, and again, if you go back and look at last week's study, you'll see we talked about, because in the different translations, it's called testing, trouble. I mean, there's different, you know, words are used in the translation. Job said, I know that when I have been tested, I shall come forth this fine gold. Because it is a refining process when you talk about it that way. Okay, so if it's happening, if it's happening to us, it's, it certainly is a purification. It's, it's something to get rid of those last, last impurities. Mm -hmm. Because he is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Okay. What I was going to get to, with Stephen, it was neither. It was a testimonial for other people, because what Stephen saw is Christ on the throne. Well, that so he, it, behold, I see the heavens opened up and yeah. the Son of Man standing. Right, what he saw was the glory of God. I, I understand that. So, I mean, this is you're, you're right. It's a testimony. The saints overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, because they did not love their life even unto death. Our lives are supposed to be a testimony of. Like this, like the glory of God. So people see God in us. People see. You know, the early church grew 
because of the way the church responded to persecution. Not because they were building bigger and prettier church buildings and having donuts and coffee in the lobby. So our, our lives are supposed to be a testimony for the testing of others. Well, I don't see you how you can have a testimony without a test. <laughs> but you might be the test and not the test taker. Well, <laughs> you know, that's, that's why it's good that we're not in control. Yeah. And, and that's why it's good that we can trust God who said be anxious for nothing. He's got it covered. Just Everything. do it. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving right along. Yes. Because we have limited time. Okay. Maybe. Or we have, well, I mean, let, let's just talk about time for a minute. It might be more limited than we think. Well, the next part, the next verse says, this is Romans, uh, Revelation, rather, 3.11 says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. I'm coming quickly. Let's talk about time. We are, though born in sin as descendants of Adam, still fearfully and wonderfully made. That's what it says in Psalm 139, right? <clears throat> That's what David declared. Part of that divine design is revealed when Solomon, speaking of time, wrote that God had set eternity on the hearts of mankind. Ecclesiastes 3.11. Mm -hmm. There's an appointed time for everything. Yes. In that passage, God said, when he goes all about this time. There's a time for this, there's a time for that. But then he, then he says, God has set eternity on man's heart. That's part of the divine design. Everybody that is born into this world has eternity. And in, in it. Well, that's why man wants to live forever. We I mean, now just search for the fountain of youth. And that's well, because that's the eternity. It's an inherent exactly. knowledge of eternity, eternity right? right? So the curse of Adam's sin, which was passed on to all generations, was that curse was simply stated death. Separation. Well, no, just let's talk death. Okay. So now we have an inherent knowledge of eternity, but we're confronted from birth with the reality of the brevity yes. of our natural life. Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. Yes. David wrote in the Old Testament, man is a mere breath. Mm -hmm. His days are like a passing shadow. Mm -hmm. Psalm 144.4. Mm -hmm. James wrote in the New Testament, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. James 4.14. So everybody knows that there's a limit to time. But of course, God Almighty provided the cure to that curse of death yes. and the short life that is the consequence of that curse. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. Everybody knows that verse. I mean, think about what it means. All right? Death has been conquered. Paul goes on. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Where is thy victory? Death has been conquered. Yes. So that all of a sudden, eternity is there. We dwell in eternity. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So now, this is where you, you better get your little note paper out. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Two people standing in the same room, maybe maybe even side by side. 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 Mm -hmm. One already dead. In his transgressions, that's what it says in Ephesians 2 and Colossians, Colossians 2. And the other, having believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning work, and having received the free gift of eternal life, they should and would have an entirely different perspective on time. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not afraid of death because it doesn't end. And you've already done it. Yeah, and I've already done it. I've died. My life is in me. Yes. So, you know, I don't have I don't have to fear that as the unsaved does. The unsaved, okay. if they they still have that be born again experience ahead of them. That's their option. option. That's their choice. That's the only way out. That's the only escape, right? right? All right. So you got that picture. You got two people. One knows. I mean, they they have they want to be eternal. Right. They want to live forever. Right. And they try and find natural and human ways to accomplish that. Exactly. I mean, really. Mm -hmm. But here, I say, I've done nothing 
other than accept what God has done for me. And I have that eternal life. So my perspective on time is different than their perspective on time. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So that explains, of course, why the famed Jewish theoretical physicist Albert Einstein came so close but got it all wrong. I knew that would put a smile on your face. Okay. okay. You're looking at me like, I wonder how much time this is going to take up. Part of Einstein's theory of relativity deals what is with what is called time dilation. Time dilation is a difference in actual time, actual time, between two events measured by people differently situated. Okay. What? <laughs> Simply stated, time is relative. That's part of the theory of relativity, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's based primarily on movement. Okay? Mm -hmm. you, you're going to look this up on your through right now? Okay. It's a fact, and now it's a proven fact, that when they've sent astronauts into space, they come back and they haven't aged as much yes. as they would have had they stayed on Earth. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the difference is minuscule, mm -hmm. but they have been able to scientifically record the fact that their movement, their acceleration, movement around the planet, has literally changed time for them. Mm -hmm. Okay? It might have been a second or a split second. It was. On the space shuttle circling the Earth. Right. It, it, okay. it has been. But the fact is, it's been proven that there's literally a difference in time. Okay. Okay? But think it's based on movement. Mm -hmm. So, Einstein, who seemed to be unsure of spiritual things. Okay. I mean, you know, you can talk about how brilliant he was, and I can remind you, though I may not, that God changed the wisdom of the wise, okay? He declared himself to be an agnostic, and a year before he died, he wrote in a personal letter that he did not believe in a personal God. And to a Baptist pastor, he, he once stated that I do not believe in immortality of the individual. One can only hope that in the last final year of his life, maybe he had a greater revelation than relativity, and became a relative of the Father. Mm -hmm. That would be the hope. All right. Mm -hmm. what, what, what really matters here is not what Einstein thought of time, or for that matter, what you or I think of time, based on the movement of this little blue ball called Earth going around you know, the sun. Because that's what our understanding of time comes from. Mm -hmm. What matters, as always, is what God says about time. Listen to this verse from Psalm 90, or four verses actually. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. There it is. He's our dwelling place. You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born and you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He turned man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, understanding the Lord's perspective of time is connected to us understanding that He, not this world, is our dwelling place. Amen. <laughs> and Peter, yes. who wrote to us as aliens, strangers, and sojourners, who don't have a permanent dwelling place here on this land, said, Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. Second Peter 3.8 Alright, so having taken a bit of time travel, we can now know with certainty that Jesus is absolutely right to say, Behold, I am coming quickly. <laughs> Hallelujah! And Peter had great Holy Spirit given wisdom and inspiration when he wrote what is a commentary on this verse that he had yet to hear when he wrote, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with them mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. The unsaved, the mockers, the unmoving dead, who cannot understand time. We are supposed to 
If you, if you don't understand it, you know it. All right? Jesus is coming quickly. It may be, a, it may be tomorrow. It may be a thousand years from tomorrow. But the fact of the matter is, he is holy and true, and he said the truth. He is coming quickly. You've got to understand. He's going by his time, not ours. Not ours. Not ours. In the scheme of eternity, what's a thousand years? That's why people, you know, I, I don't think Christians should have ever have anxiety about aging. No. I mean, I am now, this year I will be 72 years old. Mm -hmm. I still haven't figured out if I've reached middle age. And if you can tell me what half of eternity is, write to me at officeofbibletalk.com and let me know, because I can find if 71 years is half of eternity, then I'm middle age. Otherwise, I'm still a child of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. You'll okay. always be a child of God. What's that song of, as we've been there 10,000 years? Yeah, amen, yeah. So middle age is 5,000 at least. Okay. I mean, listen, have a good time. This is. Can't you see how the scripture... From beginning to end connects. Yes, it does. I mean, this is where you find knowledge and revelation and understanding is what God has written. It's threaded throughout. It oh, and now amazing. the great attack that is going on, yes. and, and that attack is growing by leaps and yes, bounds, yes, yes, yes. is a, the attack that the devil began at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You see, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. Has God really said? said? He calls the word of God into question. But Jesus Christ stands there and says, I am the truth. He who is holy and true says, I am the truth. And if you want to reach that place where there is eternal life, he said, I am the way. Okay. So then he goes on to say, hold fast to what you have. Right? Let me read you what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Whatever we have, we've been given. Absolutely everything. Okay? Everybody wants to say, well, I accomplished this, I did this, I earned this, I got... Do I know something? Everything I have is a gift from God. All good gifts come from God. That's what it says. Let me ask you a question. What would you answer if somebody were to say to you, what do you have? Remember, he said to you, hold fast to what you have. If somebody comes up to you and says, what do you have? What would you, what would you answer? Is this like a banker asking for a financial statement? You know, you list your assets on one side and your liabilities on the other. Your debts on the one side, and, you know. And then you see what lies in the balance and that's your net worth. Is that Remember, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. 1 Corinthians 2.14 We are supposed to appraise all things spiritually. So, I am going to give you, I'm going to lay myself bare here and give you my net worth. I'm going to give you a, a balance sheet. Okay, first I will tell you my debts. Zero. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us that was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. No debts. Debt free. Debt free. My assets. Jesus. Hallelujah. I am my beloved and he is mine. Now what did it cost? It cost Jesus Christ. It cost him. It was a free gift. You know, I, I say it's a free gift. We've all come to say salvation is the free gift of God. The fact is, there was never a gift that cost more than that free gift. It's free to us. It's free to us. It wasn't free to God. He paid his son Jesus Christ. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Song, Song of Solomon 6.3 So, if you take no debt, and my assets are Jesus, then my net worth is Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's simple logic. It's all here in the Word. It's simple arithmetic. And our net worth 
that value is established and proven by this fact. Paul wrote twice to the church at Corinth and to us that we were purchased with a price. The price was Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. Almighty God did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, is what Paul wrote to the Romans and to us. Romans 8.32 What we have is Jesus. What we have is the Word. He is the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. He is more desirable than gold, much fine gold. Psalm 19.10 What we have is wisdom from above, and pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it, nor silver be weighed as its price. Job 28.15 What we have is worth more than silver and gold. It's more precious than silver and gold. What we've been given that connects all of the dots, so to speak, is faith. God has dealt to each man a measure of faith. Romans 12, 3. And that is what he said he will be looking for when he returns. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on earth? Luke, 17, Luke 18, 7 and 8. Mm. Hold fast to what you have. Faith. faith. Because that's what connects it all together. Mm. That's what connects the love. That's what connects the power of the word. It's faith. Now I believe that the great warning or encouragement from the Lord here to us, his people in the last day, that wonderful, great, and terrible day of the Lord is that we should guard our faith, mm -hmm. which comes from hearing His Word. That's why there's such a, an attack, attack on, on the Word. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Remember that He had just said to the church at Philadelphia that He would make the world know mm -hmm. that He loved us because they had kept His Word. Mm -hmm. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by, the by the Word. Romans 10, 17. Fear comes by hearing. Hearing the world. And yes, there's an elevator. Yes. That's what it says in Psalm 55, verses 2 and 3. David said when he listened to the enemy, when he paid attention to what the world was saying, he became very distracted. Yes. He became nervous and distracted. You have a choice. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, be careful what you listen to. You have a choice of what you're listening to. I mean, I, I pray that you're, you're listening to this. Because you share a love for the Word. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be watching some silly reality show on television. You know what? You listen to the world. And listen means pay attention to, right? If you take it in, you're going to grow in fear. Yeah, you listen to the Word of God. You listen to what Jesus has to say. And you will be anxious for nothing, mm -hmm. even in these perilous last days. Right. Hold fast. That's what it says. Hold fast. Jesus did caution us not to let his word wither and become unfruitful because of affliction or persecution or because of the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. The sower the That's the sower and the seed. Mm -hmm. The parable of the sower and the seed. You've got to hold fast. You've got to keep faith so that no one will come and take your crown. And i got to tell you, I want the crown. <clears throat> Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. 2 Timothy mm -hmm. 4, 7 and 8. What greater crown can there be than one that proclaims righteousness? Mm -hmm. I have a desperate desire to have that crown so that when we are in the very presence of the great I Am, the Ancient of Days, the Lord of Lords, when we are in the physical presence, I will be equipped to worship as the 24 elders do. Let me read you <clears throat> Revelation 4, verses 8 to 11. And the four living creatures, this is after the churches are gone, this is when we're all there, gathered in that place. Cross the Jordan, brother. 
And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. Mm. I want to have a crown to cast Amen. before the throne. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, and like I said, you have nothing you haven't received. The Lord is prepared to give us a crown. And that crown, which will proclaim our righteousness because of His work, we will take and worship is giving back to God the thing that is most precious to you, as Abraham did mm -hmm. with his son Isaac. That's worship. May not be what you thought, but that's what worship is. Come, let us worship and bow down. Well, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you that you, you equip us for all that you call us to, Lord. And that when you call us to worship in spirit and in truth, you will equip us with a, with a perfect way to do that. That as we hold fast and, and stay faithful, Lord God, that you will give us crowns, and we will have those crowns to offer back to you. I thank you, Lord God, that we have your word. Your word made flesh, first of all, did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And I thank you, Lord, that even though the world turns upside down and it is filled with demonic rage, that lawlessness increases, that all of these things go on that we talked about, that we can truly be anxious for nothing. We can have a peace that passes understanding. That we can have a peace that only your son Jesus, Father, gave us and the world can't give. Father, help us to be a living testimony of your love and power. Help us in our lives to lift you up, Jesus, that men might be drawn to you, that some might be rescued in these perilous last days. We just praise you and thank you that you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise that you can use our lives to bring glory to your name. I bless you and praise you. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Well, that was hallelujah. Mm -hmm. It's been good to be with you yes. again. Don't forget, all of these studies are up on the Bible Talk website, including other studies that we've done. So you can invite others, if they've not watched it, to come and join and be yes. part of it. And we'll pick up in uh, verse 12 in our next session. But until then, I know that my sweet patootie Alice wants to tell you Jesus loves you a lot. Amen. So from the three of us to you, God bless you and goodbye. Be used for the glory of his name. See you next time. Thank you, Lord.